if I had to have one piece of advice, it would be to collaborate um, early and and as much as possible because working in uh, teams is is so important. Switching off emails on the weekends uh, is just a really practical way of of getting a little bit more balance and being able to uh, unplug uh, when you can. And so informed decisions and supportive care means how we highlight the breadth of the elements required to support decision-making by caregivers and patients. Greetings and a warm welcome to The Comfort Corner, a palliative care series on Oncodaily. We aim to raise awareness about the critical need for palliative and supportive care among cancer patients with the goal of improving their quality of life. Our motto, Navigating Life's Twist with Compassion, encapsulates our mission. My name is Martin Howard Union, and I am a medical oncologist and palliative care specialist based in Yerevan, Armenia. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Joanne Bowen, distinguished expert in cancer therapy-related toxicities, particularly GI adverse effects. Professor Bowen is currently a professor at the School of Biomedicine, University of Adelaide, where she leads the Cancer Treatment and Toxicities Group. She also serves as the faculty honors coordinator and the associate dean of gender equity, diversity, and inclusion. Professor Bowen has received numerous awards for the outstanding contribution to the field, including the Stephen Cole, the Elder Award for Excellence in Supervisory Practice in 2021, and the Telstra Women's Business Award in the Public Sector and Academia in 2016. Professor Bowen has been actively involved with the Multinational Association of Supportive Care in Cancer, including being co-chair of the Mass Guidelines Working Group and former chair of the Awards Committee. She is currently the chair of the Mass 2025 and 2026 annual meetings. Her research focuses on developing preclinical models for testing intervention used by the pharmaceutical industry aiming to improve cancer outcomes through personalized treatment and supportive care. Professor Bowen's recent work includes undertaking clinical trials of novel treatments for chemotherapy-induced side effects. Her group investigates both the underlying mechanisms and treatment approaches to prevention of common toxicities of different cancer therapies. Her projects focus on establishing new approaches to mitigating side effects by targeting interactions between gut microbiome, the immune system, and the brain. Professor Bowen, we are very glad to have you with us today. Thank you very much for inviting me. Professor Bowen, your journey in supportive care is truly inspiring. What personal experiences or professional encounters led you to specialize in this field and could you share some key moments that shaped your journey? Sure. Thank, thank you very much. I, I guess there's probably two things that stand out for me. The first being when I was quite young, um, I, you know, witnessed my auntie going through um, treatment for gastric cancer and um, really being very, feeling very helpless um, watching her suffer through side effects of that treatment and her inability to kind of engage with family gatherings and really the toll it took on her physical um, function. So I think that was the first thing. And then the second thing was joining uh, the research team um, of my supervisor and mentor, Professor Dorothy Keith, and seeing her and her, her, her colleagues and how they had so much passion for improving the treatment and, and lives of people that were undergoing cancer treatment. I started with that group as a technical officer and very rapidly decided that I should do a PhD in this field because I really felt that it was so important. Your work has had a significant impact on global health. Can you elaborate on how your research and leadership roles have contributed to international policies and care standards in supportive oncology? Uh, yeah, great question. I think um, probably the best example is through my time as a co-chair of the MASC Mucositis Study Group. Um, and 
In that role, I help to bring together global experts in the field to review all of the evidence from clinical trials in the space um, that were looking at ways to prevent or manage oral mucositis, uh, proctitis, diarrhea related to chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And I suppose the example of those guidelines is now they are in use um, across the world. They are very actively used in mask centres of um, excellence. They have been translated into over seven different languages, and so they're really showing that the uptake and, and usability is is very um, good for those those guidelines. My particular role um, was in development of the methodology uh, for the systematic review component of that guidelines generation, and really just ensuring that the way we approached that uh, activity was to be as thorough and to collect all of the relevant information and make sure that our findings were as accurate and impactful as possible. I guess another example probably is um, the work I've done over a number of years in the preclinical space. So um, collaborating with different industry partners to test different interventions for particularly diarrhea related to some of the targeted therapies and knowing that the work that I've done in that um, preclinical space has now been translated into lots of uh, different clinical trials that are showing benefit in clinical practice um, to mitigate some of those TKI-induced um, side effects in particular. Thank you. Given your extensive involvement in mentorship, uh, what advice do you give to young professionals who aspire to make a significant impact in supportive oncology? I guess I'm really fortunate in in my role in that I am an educator and I I get to see people all the way from sort of their first year at university up through to in, into their professional lives. And so I get to kind of um, have the opportunity to um, bring awareness of what supportive um, care is and how valuable it is. I think if I had to have one piece of advice, it would be to collaborate um, early and and as much as possible because working in uh, teams is is so important. We are in teams. We're much more than just the sum of the individuals, and particularly when those teams are multidisciplinary. They're able to approach problems in such a holistic way and really has a lot of impact. The other thing I, I would say, and this has really been from my experience and, and what I hope that I instill in, in my group and, and people that come through my lab is that getting involved in a uh, society like MASK um, is really, really crucial. There is so much activity and so many opportunities to get involved Um early on in in career stage which which sets up for like such a um excellent and meaningful and impactful career over the long term oh, thank you balancing numerous roles is no easy feat how do you manage to handle your professional responsibilities with your personal life and what strategies do you use to maintain a healthy work-life balance I mean, I guess a healthy work-life balance is absolutely always important. It's not always executed perfectly. I do my best. I try. I think the strategies that I've been um, implementing of late has really been around delegation and 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 delegation of of things that I may have um, wanted to do initially, but now if I can pass them on to other people to take on, that really helps with their career development as well. So it's, it's about sharing some of that load. I'm, I'm also getting a lot better at recognizing some responsibilities to avoid or not take on. Um, so, so keeping, keeping my work load manageable. Um, and I think, Switching off emails on the weekends uh, is just a really practical way of, of getting a little bit more balance and being able to uh, unplug uh, when you can. During COVID, I took up open water swimming. And so uh, doing something for myself really helps shift that balance um, in a way. And, you, and you, know, you can't get an email when you're swimming in the ocean. So it's, it's actually perfect. As the chair of the MASK 2025 annual meeting, you play a crucial role in shaping 
the event. Can you give us a glimpse into the planning process and highlight some of the key topics that will be discussed at this year's meeting? Um, fantastic. Yeah, I'm, I'm really fortunate to be given um, the opportunity to host the 2025 meeting as well as the 2026 meeting. One of the things that uh, really was evident right at the beginning of planning this meeting is me being physically in, in Australia and the meeting being in the US, I had to assemble my, you know, my, my local organizing um, committee to really help ensure that any uh, themes and things we were thinking about for this meeting would have that local perspective and insight. So uh, putting together that, that sort of team included Gary Lyman, Hope Rugo, Eric Rowland, and Joel Epstein, and they have been absolutely fantastic for, for getting this meeting uh, working in a way that suits, you know, not just our, our global membership, but as well as having that flavor of the local US um, context. And so together, we've really discussed and road tested the different themes uh, that we wanted to highlight in this meeting. Um, we've worked with patient partners and with our broader networks to ensure that we would have areas that were of interest, but also um, plugged some of the gaps in, in topics that are not covered by other meetings. And so this really led us to focus on a few things, including uh, the role of financial toxicity, uh, repurposing drugs in supportive care, um, how chronic toxicities are managed, as well as um, some of the emerging treatments and the emerging toxicities to start to look out for. Thank you. The theme for this year's MASK meeting is informed decisions in supportive cancer care. What does this theme mean to you and how will it be reflected in the meetings, uh, sessions and the agenda? Uh, yeah, so great question. So informed decisions in supportive care means how we highlight the breadth of the elements required to support decision-making by caregivers and patients. And this can include the use of digital technology, practice guidelines and clinical trial innovation, uh, patient education models and patient uh, co-design models, as well as, um, you know, using new reporting methods, automation in decision-making and, and um, patient-reported outcome measures, both using sort of small all the way up to very large scale implementation. Um, these themes are really woven throughout the program. Um, you will see them uh, in our plenary sessions, in the parallel sessions, in our workshops. Abstract submitters were able to nominate their research aligned to this theme or uh, any of the other major themes, um, as well as the chairs of the mass study groups were able to invite international speakers that were absolute experts in this area, as well as experts in, in the study group topics. So it's really embedded throughout all of the sessions. Thank you. The mass annual meeting is known for fostering collaboration and knowledge sharing. What are some of the most exciting sessions or topics that attendees can look forward to? And how do you hope? hope uh, this will impact the field of supportive care? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's hard to narrow down um, exactly which ones are, are going to be of the biggest interest and, and excitement. But for me personally, um, I'm really looking forward to our MASK mentorship session, which we hold every year. And this is an opportunity for uh, people uh, that are more junior in their career to meet with mask leaders to discuss professional development, research ideas, and establish ongoing collaborations. Um, I'm also really looking forward to one of the workshops in um, partnering with patients for management of chronic toxicities. I think this is a really unique um, workshop because we have been very intentional of bringing together uh, experts in patient advocacy as well as clinicians to work through some enduring problems in um, managing chronic toxicities. And there'll be um, ways to um, brainstorm and discuss, you know, the, how we can problem solve in this space. 
Uh, there's also a very strong digital health uh, theme that is um, very, very clear in the program, which will be quite exciting and I think very informative um, for, for our uh, participants. The impact that I hope will be um, on supportive care through the delegates taking back this new knowledge, these these new perspectives, their new contacts and, and networks and collaborators to be able to take that to their workplace and really spread the, the message of MASK that supportive care makes excellent cancer care possible and which will really, you know, help us to increase and um, establish that momentum around our focus, which is to, of course, improve care and the lives of people with cancer and beyond. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Bowen, for your invaluable insights today. And thanks to our listeners for joining us. Keep exploring supportive care and join us next time for more discussions at the Comfort Corner. Take care. Thanks very much. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Onka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.